Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hello, Judy. How are you today? I'm great. Thanks for inviting me on. I'm really excited to have you on the podcast, actually. It's been a long time in the coming, right? Because you were moving house and you had to delay things. So we've had a, a big break and um, in terms of getting you here. <laughs> and so I hope your move went smoothly and you're settled in by the looks of it. I am settled in now. Great. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. Well... Judy, I, I'm, I'm very naughty and lazy at the same time. I ask one question to begin with. I have no other rehearsed questions. And the, the one question is, well, Julie, uh, thanks for coming on the podcast. Um, would you like to share your story and how you got where you are today? I would. And I'm actually excited and been waiting a long time to be more public about my story. So I really appreciate that you you have this format that I can talk more about it. Great. So, yeah, um, my story is very unique because of what I survived and have changed so much about myself and who I am because of it. Um, it's a story that goes to the depths of darkness on a personal and on a larger planetary and cosmic level. Yeah. It's about multi-general um multi-generational abuse and its traumatic effects and that it's still happening to this day even worldwide. Mm. Um some who have survived this kind of what I consider extreme trauma that I'll be mentioning have gone public with full details. And I think it's a really brave move, but I've chosen to do my journey really differently. Um, though I've discussed aspects publicly for the last 20 some years, but I've instead focused on my healing and helping others to heal from trauma due to childhood abuse. Yeah. So uh, just to say that I'm going to, uh, truncate a lot of the story for several reasons. I know the intensity of how hearing too much at one time affects what I call the autonomic nervous system that fight, flight, and freeze. And I want people to stay present with me. Um, I've lived through so much, or we all have lived through so much shock and trauma in the past three years. So I want to just kind of make it more gentle for everyone. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, and the other reason is that I've written a, or I will be writing a fictionalized autobiography of my life. And so there are aspects of this that um, I don't want public now and that I'll put it in symbolic or metaphorical ways when I write the book. Understood. Yeah. So, um, so what I'm about to say is going to probably be a little bit mind blowing for some and difficult for others, while uh, some are going to be able to relate to it historically or what's going on presently as well. Yeah. So, I was born during the Cold War in the 50s. And people reflect on that time, uh, kind of like the leave it to beaver area or error. And, you know, like the Cleaver family and everything was okay, but it wasn't for millions of other children. And the country was afraid of communists and many felt that there had to be strategies to fight this. And so, this is what the history texts say, but that's on a surface level. Yeah. So meanwhile, Nazis were already being brought in to the United States through Project Paperclip. And that was during and after World War II. 
And so consider Cape Canaveral and the Nazi Werner von Braun that was brought here to work in rocketry and space during that time and through the 50s and 60s. So there were a lot more than him. So Eisenhower talked about the military industrial complex and they used their techniques from World War II and the Korean War on selected children in this country as controlled and programmed uh, experiments and slaves. Wow. Yeah. There's a lot of books actually out written about this. So um, your audience will probably be curious about that. I grew up on the East Coast of the United States in what was considered basically a Jewish middle-class neighborhood. And that was the cover religion. Um, my DNA is European Jewish, but that's not my identity in who I consider I am. Um, I consider myself a spiritual being having a human experience. Yes. And, um, and so, so the surface or the top story of my biologic family who just, by the way, I don't have contact with, was about my mother and her severe mental health issues and how much uh, she would be emotionally abusive towards me. So there was kind of the scapegoats in the family. Sure. My mother, um, I'm sorry, what? Sure, I said sure. Oh, oh, okay. So my mother was labeled with having... Um, manic depression, which is now called bipolar and was also labeled as manic suicidal. She was hospitalized often and my father hired women to take care of me and the siblings. And as a young child under three, I would go around my grandmother's neighborhood because I lived with her part-time and ask women to be my mother. And it was a big sign of having already what's considered attachment disordering. Right. And so, yeah. So my mother also attempted suicide many times, even while she was pregnant with me. And I actually discovered this in a repressed memory. And it was confirmed by a state investigator um, finding part of my mother's records in a very famous hospital. So I love it when this validation, you know, comes and it has come for years to me. I mean, the most bizarre things show up. Um, and my mother wasn't bipolar. Uh, she had dissociative identity disordering in what used to be called multiple personalities. And kind of like in the book, Sybil. And in fact, her abuse towards me was just like what Sybil's mother did to her. And this became- Who, Who's Sybil, Judy? Who's Sybil? So Sybil was a woman. They did a movie with Sally Fields back in the 70s. And there was a movie about it. Right. And she had many personalities. And her mother would torture her in different ways when her father was at work. Right. And so I read this book back in the early 70s when it came out and I just, it resonated with me, but I didn't have my memories then. Right. So, yeah. Um, Thank you. Yeah, sure. So as my memory started coming out, which was after the harmonic convergence, in September of 87, you know, so much started flooding in information to me. And I actually put out to God, I said, just, just give it all to me, you know, whatever happened. And I'm so grateful yeah. that yeah. it didn't come out that way. So my father and, um, well, just to say also that the sexual abuse started, um, as an infant. And that was by different relatives besides my mother. Mm. And I was being groomed 
for trafficking and more. So some of my relatives uh, made big bucks off of me in sexual training and services, and that included my maternal grandfather. My father and my paternal grandmother were not involved in the abuse. In fact, my grandmother attempted to stop her husband, my paternal grandfather, from sexually abusing me, but he retaliated and uh, became violent with her. Right. So, you know, this would, you know, the patterns in dysfunctional homes and abusive homes. So, so do your, your grandmother and grandfather are the parents of your mother? Father. Father. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, my, like I said, my father wasn't involved. My grandmother wasn't involved. No, I understand. But my I, other side was. Yeah, I didn't know. I, I was si trying to see if there was a connection between your mother and her parents. Uh, but it wasn't. It was the other side of the family, your father's side of the family and your mother. Who well, actually, doing it's both it. sides of the family. Was it? Oh, yes, absolutely. Okay. So when my grandfather died, which is when I was three years old, like right, right around that time, that abuse stopped with him. But my other grandfather was already trafficking me. Yeah. How, did, yeah. how did they communicate with each other? Do you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And that's well where I'll get to in the story. In okay, a, in sorry, I'm yes. jumping no, ahead. No, no, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> I mean, you know, you have both sides of the family being involved, so the story gets larger and larger. Yeah. Uh, so at the time, um, so kind of like skipping a little piece, in the late 80s, I did a disclosure with the family, I flew out from California to my birthplace and I gathered a few members of the family, one of them being the perpetrator, one of the perpetrators. And I did a truth sharing of what I knew at that time, which wasn't very much, but it was enough to awaken some people in my family. And my father was there and an uncle was there and a sister was there. And so I had like 40 people praying for me at the time. I mean, disclosure at that time, this was early on in the whole movement. So mm. it was a very, very big deal. And so um, during that disclosure, um, my father put his head down, which was his signal um, because he had what I considered an ostrich syndrome. <laughs> and right. that was his coping mechanism for, you know, most of my my childhood. He couldn't deal with it. And sure. I understand. I have forgiveness and compassion for that, you know, through yeah. my healing. But so um, my uh, uh, another relative after the confrontation or the disclosure, I'd rather call it, um, came forward and she had been abused by the paternal grandfather also. Right. And she had kept it basically a family secret for 50 years while she was in and out of psychiatric, you know, doctors and stuff like that. And so that was a confirmation at that time. Yes, I'm remembering, you know, what happened because nobody told me anything. You know, all of it came up through the repressed memories so, um, and actually my father knew that I had been abused by his father because he told me afterwards that he saw it and tried to stop it, taking me away from his father in the act of it, but then turned me right back to his mother living with his father because my mother was in mental hospitals. So, you know, there wasn't a choice for him. He was working. So I was, um, you know, most people think of sex trafficking of children, of taking them to places to be abused for money. And it's way more than that. So um, I was abused not only by family members, but well-known members of the community, 
with that Jewish faith and doctors and Broadway and Hollywood stars and politicians. I was taken to horrific cult ritual activities and I was used in pornography. Um, there are elements involved in all of this that are unfathomable in levels of abuse and torture and trauma involved for most people to comprehend. Um, I was also used in organized international traffic rings and even more. I've had over a hundred near-death experiences, which I stopped counting when I reached that number. And um, so that say, says, a, you know, a great deal about out-of-body experiences and spiritual experiences that I had. Yeah. Um, many times when I would cross over, Yahshua would be there and he would just hold me. And then he would lovingly tell me, remind me of what my mission was and that I would have to go back because right. I didn't, I didn't want to, you know, but I had to remember what I was here to do. Um, I've always been intuitive and I was used for my abilities in that. Um, but I didn't remember any of that because I also lived in dissociative states like my mother. Yes. And um, I integrated from dissociative identity disordering actually 28 years ago today, the day we're recording. So it's an anniversary date for me. Wow. And yeah, I know. It's amazing the timing. And um, that integration was a nine month, what I consider God birthing process for me. And I went from a we state to a me state. And um, what do you was, mean with that, Judy? Could you explain that? Well, I lived in a multiple state. So there was 28 parts of me that I consciously worked with. Right. And those those children, um, I called them my associates. So when people would call on the phone, you know, we had answering machines in those days and it yeah. would say, I would say, hi, my name is Judy. Leave a message for me and the associates. And so my friends knew what that meant. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, you have to have humor, you know? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so um, did, did that explain it enough? It does. So are you talking about multiple personalities then? Yes. 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 That's what dissociative identity disordering is. And you say 28? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Whoa. I, I've, I mean, I don't even know the topic that well at all. Obviously, I understand the phrase multiple personalities, but I would have always thought there might be, you know, one, two, or three maximum. Right. But to so have... That... Yeah. Yeah. When you said that, it reminded me of when that movie came out, you know, The Three Faces of Eve with Joanne Woodward. And, you know, actually Eve had way more than three personalities, but Hollywood didn't go there. And right. so actually 28 is not that big. <laughs> I've worked with people that had thousands of parts and they're called polyfragmented. Okay. So people don't know that. But no. yeah, yeah, no, that wasn't that big. It was a lot to manage, though, to say the least, for me. I can, yeah, I can imagine. And and how does that show up? Or how did that show up in your life with that complexity? And well, yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. I, I'm a Capricorn, so... Uh, Capricorn Sun. So I am an organizer. And I also had four outer children. So I would hear voices in my head, but I thought everybody had voices in their head. Right. 
well, they probably do, but not like I did. You know, I had screaming and crying and all kinds of, you know, don't do this. And I, I didn't know what it was. I just, you know, you live with it. And then when I started realizing as the healing went on, if I didn't listen to them, because I started to communicate with them in therapy and stuff, if I didn't listen, I sometimes had what was called body takeovers. And I would go in the background. So there would be a tear right above my eyebrow and it would be like a multidimensional shift up front. And another, and I, Judy, the host, would go in the background and the part would come out and start talking. So I'd be talking like I was a three-year-old or a six-year-old or something like that. And you've seen that perhaps in some movies, but that's really what happens. So the only time I've experienced that was in Florida, actually, because we used to live in Suriname, South America, for a, for a while. And I traveled my uncle and aunt and their daughters were living in Florida, Boca Raton. And we, my sister and I, for our 15th birthday, traveled on our own from Suriname, South America, to Florida. And my uncle used to do hypnosis. And he hypnotized me. So I'm 15 years old. And he he always remembered when I was a three-year-old, I was going around the garden in Amsterdam, smelling the flowers. And on one of the flowers, there was a bee. And I got a, a fright. I ran into the house crying bzz, bzz, like this. And he, he remembered this. And so he hypnotized me to go back to that point as a three-year-old. And my sister who witnessed it, my uncle, obviously, and I could hear myself a little bit talking, but I didn't know my voice completely changed to a three-year-old. So that's the only time I experienced that. So I know what you mean now. <laughs> okay. So that was an inner child regression. That's what I call it. I, I also was yeah. certified as a hypnotherapist. So Right, right. Um, yeah, yeah. So your inner child showed up to tell you what happened, which yeah. is beautiful. Yeah, that's right. So so you would have a three-year-old, a six-year-old, a 12-year-old, an 18-year-old. You would have multiples. Yes. Exactly. And um, actually, for me, um, my parts look different than me. Like, I would look in the mirror and I wouldn't see me. I would wow. see a child with red hair and blue eyes. And it's like... I don't have blue eyes or red hair. Um, and I would also, they had names. So that is dissociative identity disordering. But there's also DDNOS. And they call it something different now. But it's not as separated in the identity. Like it might be a six-year-old or a five-year-old like you were talking about. Yeah. I had different names. I knew their voices. I knew who would come out and sometimes I didn't have any control over it. So um, my newer book that it's in revision now, I share some stories in there. Plus I had a book out years ago about the integration of the ID with stories of seven other women. So, you know, it goes into more detail about the processes of what happened for each right. person. Yeah. So do you think, and I know I've interrupted your flow a little bit, but I've got to ask this question in case I forget okay. it. And that is, do you think that having, cre I'm not saying that you created it, but these these characters, um, let's call it the condition that happened, was a way of coping with the trauma that you had to deal with? Is that part of why that comes up or exists? Absolutely. It's actually a brilliant coping mechanism because right. the child only has the choices of splitting, psychosis, or death. Yes. So I think that's pretty clever, you know? Yeah. yeah, 
absolutely because you you you're effectively disassociating yourself with that body physically and psychologically who is going through that trauma you're saying that's not me i'm i'm not that person that's going through that trauma that's somebody else that's right and they saved my life those parts those aspects yeah. saved my life until their jobs weren't needed anymore right and, and it was a process of self love and self acceptance and when that happened a god process occurred where they came in to my body and that let me just say that this is the anniversary date like i said and it was yeah. so traumatic for me it took me months i cried and cried and cried i didn't know Imagine. how to i didn't know how to operate in the world as one person mm. so it was like you know like trying to find my way around um in a whole nother way so do you think it was grief as well for the loss of those personalities or those individuals yeah, yeah. i loved them yeah absolutely i, I was their imagine. mom you know i yeah. can imagine yeah um i think well, i i know that it was really hard on my other children now really hard and hmm. so um you know there were things that would happen that made it very when I switched and it was like, where's mom, <laughs> you mm. know, but they didn't know what happened. They just knew mom wasn't there. Yeah. Yeah. So, and you know, I was so functional. I worked two jobs and raised four children and went through a horrible divorce. So mm. to me, I had so much strength. When I look back at what I went through, it's just amazing to me still. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So when when that did you call it convergence? The harmonic convergence, yeah. The harmonic convergence happened for you. Um, how old were you, if you don't mind me asking? Well, the harmonic convergence was in nineteen eighty seven. That was a huge mm. planetary shift. Right. Remember okay. that? Okay, yeah. so that's when everything came up for me. Okay, well, I, I don't remember it because oh. I wasn't at that time in 87. I was not. Uh, my, my awakening didn't happen until 2004. So it was a long way after that. So I wouldn't have been conscious that anything was changing. Um, right. I know that I changed when I was like 44. Then, then That's a good number. I know. I know. Yeah. That's when everything changed for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so 1987 is when the convert harmonic convergence happened for you. And then how long did it take for you to fully integrate into who you are today? Well, that's an interesting question. The, the top 28 integrated in 95. Right. Okay. Then, I, like I said, I defined my way and I continued to have memories, but I had to feel the memories. So it was a very different experience for me. Mm. Mm. And these are repressed memories. So still to this day, I have repressed memories. Still to this day, my body somaticizes. And so it's emotionally and physically difficult sometimes. You know, yes. I have yeah. to take a lot of self-care for myself um and i do i um good yeah so i want to i want to go back to another piece of the story please. yeah yeah please. so um when i was 19 my mother um committed suicide so she finally after all the years of attempting and it took me years of healing to be able to grieve and finally release the hatred that I felt towards her. Yeah. And this was, um, so in the late nineties, I went through this four hour healing process. And actually to this day, I'm not sure what the person did, but all I know is in that evening, 
I was writing and I literally cried for hours in an awakening that occurred within me. And I experienced forgiveness to the depth of me. And all that heavy hatred that I felt towards her, it, it completely transformed into this deep love and understanding of what happened for my mother. Like, I got it. Like, I got that what happened to me had happened to her. Right. And there was this deep compassion that occurred. And um, she started to come to me in spirit form. And she would tell me more through my memories of what occurred to both of us. Right. And so it was such a deep, it's even hard to talk about it now because it touches me so deeply. Yes, I understand. Yeah. Um, so, so the extreme abuse actually went on until even after I was married, which was when I was 20 years old. And um, I had moved to California in a 1953 hippie school bus with two dogs, two cats, and uh, the furniture and a husband. And then I home birthed four children because um, I didn't want to be near doctors, but I didn't know why. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and so I was very alternative in my approach to raising them. I didn't use you know, allopathic medicine and no TV. And um, I kind of gathered herbs and um, garden and I baked bread and I canned foods and I, you know, cooked and studied and I practiced Jin Shin Jitsu, which is like acupuncture without the needles, use your fingers. And I was a dental hygienist and, you know, all of this and, you know, I, I realized, you know, I always went beyond my limits because I was trained that way. Yes. So, um, so my healing journey has been now about half my life. And um, I spent years in therapy and also working with alternative healing practitioners. So if we're coming near the end, just let me know. <laughs> no, uh, no, you're good. You're good keep okay. going yeah whatever that's fine okay um and so um as a clinical hypnotherapist you know i studied that too um yeah. i would continue to do my inner journey work and um you know work with clients and then um i'm i decided to become more of like a trauma specialist i'm really good right. at connecting the dots you know, what's going on in the world now, I actually, am, I have fun connecting. It's like second nature to me to put patterns together. Mm. And it turns out I'm usually right <laughs> because, you know, I kind of track things. That, excuse me, that was an issue for me when I had uh, DID. I couldn't track well. So it was really important that I learned how to do that. Yeah. When you say... Uh, so, so explain a little bit more about when you say you didn't track well or you 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 enjoy tracking um, because that's a phrase I haven't come across and our listeners probably don't know it either. Okay. Well, it means that I, well, there's different modes of tracking. So right now, as we're talking, I'm, we're doing some active listening with each other, you know, feeding back and forth. Okay. Yeah. That's tracking. That's a form of tracking. Another right. tracking is um, what comes up in different sources. I see connecting patterns and I put them together. And then that's how I put my memories together. So I could piece things together and then they came into a bigger picture of what was actually occurring. I couldn't track that because I would be talking to you years ago and all of a sudden I would go, what did I say? And it would terrify me that I couldn't understand where the conversation was going. Right, right, right. Okay. 
So it was part of the trauma responses of the lack of tracking and the lack of uh, ability to communicate. Um, yeah. So when I got that back, it was so exciting to me. <laughs> okay. Thank you for that. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, of course. Because I I see it almost you know, like the picture that's coming in my head. It's It's understandable if there is so much trauma in your mind and body, then what you're saying, you're literally just saying it for what you, you know, because it's almost that you do, you, you've already programmed yourself that you don't want to remember that moment. It's almost kind of rubbing it out straight away because of all the events that you've experienced where you would literally be, I'm paraphrasing for my own understanding, you would be rubbing it out as if it didn't happen. It was actually um, the brain in trauma responses takes, it's like a biological innate ability to do that. Thank yeah. God our brains know how to protect us from that level of trauma. So yeah, the coping mechanisms that come from that, like you said, are mm. going to be like, if something feels too much, I'm going to block it out. Yeah. I'm going to go on another trajectory. Yeah. And that makes it a little difficult uh, for other people to communicate. But that's how I know when I'm talking to someone, whether yeah. they also have dissociative uh, coping mechanisms as well. Yes. All being, yes, not taking away anything from the horrendous trauma that you've been through and you have my deepest compassion for everything you've gone through. And I'm, I'm so sorry you as a human on this planet has had to suffer that much. And at the same time, now you have managed to do a lot of healing and the healing continues. I totally get it. Because of your experience, you are a better empathetic healer than you would be otherwise because you can recognize the traits in people you can see what's happening for them and how to help them is absolutely. that right yeah absolutely that empathy that care that compassion it's like i get it <laughs> you mm. know and i yeah. want to awake other people to get it to understand the pattern so when they see people that are serial killers and do horrific things, they will understand where it came from. It doesn't come from nowhere. That mm. person had to be traumatized to act like that. And all of these patterns will be in my revised book that I'm almost finished you know, editing. Yeah. So I wanna awaken people to bring their compassion. Sure, you can hate others, but guess what? When we hate others, our energy connects to them. And I don't want my, my power, my energy connected to someone who abused me. Yeah. I want my power. And that's why I believe in forgiveness. Yeah, I, I love that statement. It's, and at the same time, I, I think you're hundred percent right there. You don't want to give your energy to the abuser or to all these people that have done horrible things. And I have looked within myself of knowing of people who have been, maybe are still abusers. And it is really, really hard to go into that space of forgiveness for those individuals because all you want for them is to be punished and to be put in jail and never to see the light of day. So we had a case in the UK recently where a policeman abused women for years without getting caught, for years in the London Metropolitan Police. And he was sentenced the other day 
or 30 years in prison. And there were a lot of comments that said it's not long enough. You know, he won't come out of jail until he's like in his 80s. Um, people said it's not long enough. He should die in prison. And, and I have sympathy with that comment. Um, and it, you know, whether it's men or women, it usually is men um, in terms of the kind of abuse. Um, being a man myself, I I say this often to my wife, who's who's also had some experience, lived experience, that sometimes I've I embarrassed to be a man because of what men do towards women, children, other men. Um, yeah, it's it's not nice at all. You know. Thank you for sharing as a man what your feelings are about it, mm. you know, and I totally understand that outrage and the rage. I couldn't have gone through what I've gone through and realized about the forgiveness unless I went through those stages also of the rage and the outrage and the grief and the terror and all of that, you know, yeah. so I get it, but can we survive as a, as a planet in hatred? Is that where we want to put our consciousness? No. Okay. Yes, those people need to be separated from society for sure. But there are other ways to handle that. You have to remember those men that did those things, where they get those behaviors? Yeah. That's why my book explains this they yeah. were little boys and by the way one in five women not one in five women but out of those who abuse children one fifth are women just to say and my mother was an abuser yeah was she abused you bet she was yeah. okay so you can start to see that patterning do you see what i mean so uh, totally, totally. The conditioned mind is responsible for a huge amount. And that conditioning happens to people and the trauma and those, you know, personalities and the fact that she event in the end couldn't live with herself um, right. explains well, she, a lot. Exactly. She couldn't live with herself. And that's why she tried when she was pregnant with me. Yeah. When that memory first came up, I thought she was trying to kill me. I thought it was personal. Yeah. But when I did it through creator, when I looked at the truth of it, the highest truth of it, mm. I realized that she did it to save both of us. She didn't want me to go through what she had gone through. Yeah. And I yeah. cried so much in realizing the highest truth of that. So people have different levels of truth in which they understand things, you know, and um, and I, like I said, totally understand people wanting to punish. Yeah. But can we continue that without, you know, back in the 70s, they were trying to um, do different kinds of reform of people in prison. Mm. And and that went by the wayside. I say start to bring that back and start to deal with those prisoners with waking up their inner child who was abused. Yes. That's my thought. Well, yeah, 100%, because the energy of those thought processes, those feelings and everything will never be healed or transmuted if there are so many human beings walking around the planet with these feelings and the energy of this, and all we will get is just repetition, 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 until we start healing each other. Um, yeah. And this is the time, Michael. So thank you for saying that, because this mm. is it. We yeah. are here now in the planetary shifting. Yeah. So those criminals will be, brought to justice and some of them have been just to say right. and okay and we're going to hear things on the world stage that are going to shock us 
I already know this, but it's kind of like the rest of humanity needs to wake up to know what's really been going on because we've been in a spiritual war. And all of this is going to be um, brought forward. And it already is now. You know, yeah. things that happen on those laptops, that's what happened to me, but I wasn't on those laptops. Okay. No. So just to say it's already in public view if yeah. the public is awake to it. So I'm just kind of excited. I really am. I'm very excited as an intuitive and having visions for years of what we're actually moving into. And I want people to get excited. I really mm. do. I want people to know that even though it's going to look chaotic, because when a woman gives birth, you know, it's really crazy during the pushing and the shoving, you know, having yeah. done four children. <laughs> and mm. so then you get the Cracker Jack surprise, you know? So I feel that we are going through some severe birthing pains right now until yes. we shift into that Aquarian age. And I think March is going to be very eye-opening, just to say. Well, thank you for that. Um, I will definitely be looking out for that and keeping in touch with everything that's going on. And it's interesting what you say, because for years now, my wife and I have been kind of observing from a distance, not from a distance, we're in the middle of it all, but sometimes she kind of go in the helicopter and look down and look at the chaos and go, look at all the chaos that's going on around us, you know, without getting completely involved. Of course, you can't fully not be in the midst of it because you're a human and you have to live your life. And, um, but there, it, 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 it almost does seem like the, you know, the pandemic we went through, uh, all sorts of other things that have happened since you, you kind of thinking, where is this leading to? Um, there's something meaningful going on, but we can't quite put our finger on it. Um, so yeah, we've become observers. So I look, I kind of look forward to observing more about what's going to transpire over the coming months and years for sure. Yeah, so Judy... I really... Oh, go ahead. No, no, go, go for it. Go for it. I was Sorry. just going to say, I just uh, would invite you to continue that overview and start mm. connecting the dots. It's so obvious right now. I laugh every day. I, I know that sounds funny, but, um, <laughs> and I'm not trying to minimize and I'm not a bypasser. Like I no. get what's going on, sure. but I see those patterns connecting and I see I see some real huge comedy in the clues that are being given to humanity right. in, in this wake up. Yeah. Very good point. So all of the journey that you've been on, you've obviously, you're writing a book right now, but you've written a book previously too. Is that correct? Actually, I've written two books. Two books. Right. And your third one is in revision or in editing right now. It's in editing and it's actually three books because it was 900 pages. So <laughs> I couldn't do it in one book. Whoa. Oh, my word. That's amazing. So um, and then the work that you're doing today, could you give get us right up to date with what it is that you do for people? So. I started my journey into theta healing back in 98. The year prior, my guides told me that I was going to meet someone for my next step. And then I met this medical intuitive um, named Viana Stiebel. She came to my area. I was the first person to continue in California with theta healing. Um, it's now called theta healing technique. Uh, Viana healed herself of terminal cancer or creator healed her, I should say, of terminal cancer in less than 30 seconds. And so she went on to teach more techniques and it's become a worldwide um, movement. Uh, we're just about in every country except Antarctica. So um, right. 
we we work with a connection to the divine source of all that unconditional love and people call it god or source or creator whatever you call it sure and we have a meditation to help us remember because we're all connected to that energy yeah. we are never separated but we have so many beliefs that tell us that it's separate from us so we work yeah. with beliefs we work with healing techniques and connection we can see inside the body we call it remote sensing uh we can remote view but it's a, it's sacredly done we have quantum level techniques because everything is atoms and how yes. we think about the formation of those atoms is through our belief systems and so we can change that i've watched tumors disappear in one hour literally and with the doctor verification how is that possible because i've changed enough of my beliefs to witness for somebody else yeah. does everybody change that fast no because they have beliefs too so sure. we work through those so that we can see how it serves them what what is it doing for them to hold their paradigm in a certain way so i have developed my trauma techniques through this method yeah in order to expedite the healing in order to work with the inner child um in order to um be to be able to also calm the body down after a session because it often somaticizes and to make sure that my clients walk out with calm and emotional stability. Go ahead. So all of that is really important to me. And from 25 years of working as a theta healer, I, I put together these patterns and these understandings and awareness to make it easier for those who are theta healing practitioners and to allow the general public to know what we're doing. And mm you know, to let them know about this beautiful love-based healing art. Wow, sounds incredible. And do you do this in person? You have to have the physical body with you or you do this remotely as well? Well, healings can be just sent generally. It yes. doesn't need to be in person at all, okay? No. And we do that a lot. I mean, I've had like 50 people send me unconditional love and I feel it. It feels lovely yes. <laughs> and remind me afterwards michael i'd be you know grateful to let you experience that and so um and then um we're talking see. about the remote the remote yeah. feeling yeah we can um i do my sessions through zoom right i used to do them in person okay so it yeah. can be done either either way Gotcha. Um, I prefer because most of my clients have um, trauma, yeah, childhood abuse. And so I prefer to also see them. Though I am clairaudient, I like to see so I can pace them how they are moving through, you know, their faces, how they're changing, their breath, stuff like that. So I can uh, make sure I don't overwhelm them. Got it. Got it. Right, right, right. Got it. And you've been doing it for a long time. I mean, I didn't hear about theta healing technique. Well, probably in the, the late noughties, probably. And I've never had it, never experienced it before. I've never met a practitioner before. So you're my first practitioner that I've, that I've met. And so thank you very much. And thank you for sharing about that. And is there anything else that you do for people? Well, you know, it's interesting. I'm kind of moving away from one-to-ones because I also am a founding member of the Moving Beyond Trauma Project. So that's a nonprofit. And right. we, we gather together so that we can educate people. And as we raise our funding and stuff, our feeling is that we want to connect with other agencies and nonprofits to create centers for those who have been abused and that this be free. Uh, you have no idea how, when there's extreme trauma, how it affects the money issues. Yes. Because 
the where it's located, the hips and uh, sexual, you know, chakra, where you know abuse occurs, mm. also is where money issues land. So it affects our energy. And I want those people. I struggled uh, years ago to pay for therapies for myself. Mm. I don't want yeah. people to go through that. No. Amazing. Well, that's wonderful. So is there anything that I haven't asked that you would have liked to have shared, <laughs> Judy? Apart from, I'm going to ask you in a minute to share how people can get in touch with you, but anything general that uh, you would have liked to have shared? Um, not really, other than to say... It just it just came up this week, which I was pretty excited about, just as verification of things changing on the planet. Yes. In the United States, there was a whistleblower. Her name was Tara Rodas, and she, she through Project Veritas, which is a nonprofit journalism uh, organization, uh, has that the U.S. Congress is considering having a congressional hearings. Uh, to make known about government sponsored taxpayer funding, child trafficking and what's going on. I'm like, oh my God, what a time to be alive, you know, to see this happen. So another thing for me that I get excited about, but I just wanna say that I feel that our future generations will look back at this time and go, wow, wow, what an epic, experience that occurred yeah. at that time yeah and so thank you for you know having me here and i get to talk about this well i really appreciate you talking about it and yeah make sure that the message gets heard loud and clear how can people get in touch with you judy um they can go to um my website, which is the flow of healing.com or the nonprofits, which is probably my preference. And that is the moving beyond trauma project.org. The moving beyond trauma project.org. Yes. Great. Okay. So I'll make sure those are in the show notes so people can get in touch with you, find out more about your work, um, get, updates about your upcoming book when do you think your new book might be launched oh gosh my prayer <laughs> my prayer is by april 1st but okay because it's in editing phases and you know if you've ever written a book or anything oh gosh editing you finally have to let the baby go yes so, <laughs> yes so that's my and remember this is like three books that i'm editing yeah so. Wow. Incredible. Well, I wish you massive success with your book and the editing. It will all be worth it. I'm absolutely confident. And thank you so much for highlighting the issues around this. Um, thank you for sharing your story about it all, for being so brave. And uh, I really appreciate you. Thank and you. Thank you a lot. Okay, Judy. Well, please keep in touch. Please let me know when the book's out because I'll revisit the show notes and I'll add it, make sure to add it on for anybody who might be passing by. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Take care. Bye for now. Bye-bye. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests. So do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.